Pleased to introduce uh, the co-writer of this film you're about to see, Teresa Bertilotti, um, and uh, to say a few words about her work and the film you're going to see. Um, then Teresa will say something about the film itself, I think maybe the genesis of the, of the film. Uh, and then we'll have the screening, and afterwards there'll be uh, a Q&A with uh, Teresa and uh, Stefano Albertini, who's sitting at the back. So. Um, Teresa Bertilotti is a senior research fellow at the University of Milan, uh, Milano Bicocca. Uh, she's currently a visiting fellow in this department, Department of Italian Studies at NYU, and she was here last semester as well. Um, so we're very pleased to have her with us. Um, she works in an area that's quite similar to mine, or at least to my interests. We have a lot of overlapping interests. Um, she has published books and essays on uh, youth and education in the 20th century in Italy. Uh, on women's work during the First World War, uh, and on the impact of war on families, particularly the death of, uh, of men in the war on the, on the families. Um, and the particular focus of her recent work is on the role of popular entertainments, so in particular cinema and variety theatre, in building a national um, identity, uh, or in nation building, uh, and also in building a, a collective sense of national history. And this project really hasn't been done before. Surprising, nobody's really thought of doing this before. What, what has been the role of cinema or, going, or variety shows in giving ordinary Italian people a sense of their collective belonging to the nation? Um, this wasn't an obvious thing. The nation's formed out of nothing in 1861. Um, it has lots of problems of consolidating itself. So Teresa's work is asking the question, what is the role played by movies and by variety shows in, in this kind of uh, nation building? Um, she's currently completing a book about this, which covers the years 1860 to 1918. Um, and she's also editing, together with Melania Mazzucco, a new edition of the novel by Anna Franchi, Il Figlio in Guerra. Um, Anna Franchi was the woman who uh, founded in Milan the Lega per l'assistenza delle madri dei caduti, in other words, the League for the Assistance for Mothers of um, Men Who Had Died in the War, um, and her own son was killed in the war. So I'm looking very much to forward to seeing this, this new edition of the novel. Uh, Teresa also, as you will see, w also works with film and video um, in two ways, I, in, and this is again quite close to the work I do. She uses film and video as a method of investigating, in other words, as a resource. So she looks at, uses archives to, um, you know, to find old, old newsreels, old documentaries, but also fiction films, even commercials. Um, to try and access bits of information about the past. And then she uses film also as a publication medium, as a means of disseminating this kind of information to audiences, and as we'll see in this project. Uh, I just want to say a word about the film. I think Teresa will explain how it came to be. The f it started as a film, and then it became a book, which she wrote, uh, with a lot of these letters included. I think there were 17,000 letters that you and Marco Santarelli went through in the archive of the President of the Republic. And of course, you can only access letters that are 40 years or more old because of the restriction on more recent ones. So the letters she studied went from 1948, the beginnings of the first presidency of the Republic, to 1971, I think, because you started research in 2012. 46 to 71, yeah, OK. Um, and um, I want you know just say one word about this. Letters to heads of state, and we're talking about a letter to heads of state go back a long way in history. Italy is not the only country that's had this. People have written letters to kings, uh, to monarchs, to get them to intercede in, in everything from you know helping them sell a cow to you know fixing their illnesses to um, arranging their marital problems. Um, and um, in fact, in Italy itself, there have been other collections of letters to heads of state. There were the uh, Renato Montalioni's Lettere al Re, which is about letters written by ordinary soldiers to the king during World War I. Um, then there's the collection that Camilla Cedena did, uh, Caro Duce, which is letters that women wrote to Mussolini, thousands of those. Clearly Mussolini didn't read them personally. Um, and I think the same thing with the letters to the president. Uh, Queen Elizabeth receives every day, I think, still 200 letters a day or 300 in an age of email and Facebook Messenger. And she has a whole kind of team of people who reply to these letters claims to read some herself, I'm not so sure about that. She's now in her 90s. Um, but anyway, this is, a, this is a, a widespread practice. And I think what's very moving about the letters, and you'll see this in the film, is that people really do 
ask about all sorts of things. They say, you know, I can't, have, you know, we're living three children in a, in a room or four children in a small house. Please, President, help us get a bigger house. Help my family get a pension. Um, there's a very moving one I found particularly in the film, which is this um, girl who's 18. When she was a child, she had her legs burned in an accident. Um, she said she can't get a job. I think the story is her fiance has left her. And she's asking the president for money, a loan of money, so she can have an operation. And she says, I'll, when I get a job, I'll pay all this money back to you. Um, so, you know, there's these terribly um, sort of personal stories come out of the film. Um, one final thing just to say about presidents, just in case this isn't clear. The president in Italy is not, is the head of state, but he doesn't have the powers of the American president or even the French president. He doesn't have the same executive authority. He's much more of a um, ceremonial figurehead. He does have extremely important political role, as you may know at the moment, with uh, Paul Mattarella trying to see if they can get a go functioning government in Italy. He has the, he's the role of nominating the prime minister, the head of the government. But after that has been done, he really st stands back. He kind of opens uh, factories and um, you know has all these sort of ceremonial events, which I think must be the most boring job in the world. Um, but that's what he does. And of course, because he's sort of above the parties in a way, he's the recipient of these pleas for um, intervention in the way that a king's always were or Mussolini was in the fascist period. Um, so I think you'll see that in the film. Uh, you see the Quirinale, the past palace where he resides, which of course was originally a papal palace in the late 16th century. Then it became the palace of the kings of Italy up until um, 1946 when the monarchy disappeared. And then since then it's been, the, or oh, since 48, it's been the, the palace of the president. And it's a very luscious place and you see people winding up clocks and these vast halls in the Quirinale. So um, do please welcome Teresa Bertilotti. Uh, she'll say something about the film, as I say, to remind you she'll be back at the end for um, a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me thank the Casa Italiana, Professor Albertini and Professor uh, Forgas for inviting me to present uh, the uh, documentary. And thank you um, all for coming. Uh, so, only a few words about uh, the documentary. The documentary is entirely based uh, on the letters uh, sent by Italians to various presidents of the Republic uh, from 1946 to 1971. And the letters uh, um, were visually interpreted using uh, images produced by the Istituto Luce, the first state-owned uh, film company in Europe uh, founded uh, in 1924. We, look, uh, we looked at approximately 17 uh, um, letters, pres thousand, yes, <laughs> Sorry. preserved in the historical archive of the presidency of the Republic, and that uh, about 500 movies stored in Istituto Luce's historical archive. Uh, we examined the letters uh, so addressed uh, to the pre provisional head of the state, Enrico De Nicola, and to presidents Luigi Enaudi, Giovanni Gronchi, Antonio Segna, and Giuseppe Saragat. Uh, that is the pe mm, letters uh, sent uh, in relating to the period between 1946 uh, and 1971. Uh, because as Professor Forgas uh, said, according to the archival leg leg legislation, you are not allowed to see the documents of the last 40 years. So we did the research in 2012, uh, and we decided to stop uh, with uh, the um, surrogate presidency in uh, 1971. But uh, as uh, we, you will see, uh, the documentary stops uh, with a letter sent in 19. 69. That is because 1971 uh, is not an important year in Italian history. Instead, 1969 is quite uh, significant because uh, in that year the economic boom uh, came to an end and uh, terrorism uh, began. In 1969, as you may recall, there was a massacre in Milan at Piazza Fontana and uh, 17 people died. So we wanted uh, to stop uh, with a letter that uh, expresses uh, the hopes of the 60. 
uh, going back to the documents, uh, each file contains the documentation on the procedures of the Secretariat of the Presidency to try to fulfill the desire or, uh, to or satisfy the need of the writer. The information sent by the police uh, on who submitted uh, the letter, the transmission uh, uh, of the police uh, answer through the prefetture, the request that the presidency sends to institutions or ministries, and the definitive transmission of the dossier to the presidency archive. Uh, but uh, some letters uh, have been kept without keeping uh, the whole uh, documentation. From these documents emerged the relationship uh, between uh, citizens and the institution, and also a portrait of the society of the time, the values, hopes, and fears of a country which uh, has not yet uh, fully come to terms with the legacy of war and fascism and is already struggling with dreams and problems of post-war rec reconstruction in modern times. And working on this documentary for me was a fun and an important experience because uh, it taught me how to tell stories uh, through images that is different no, from uh, uh, illustrate uh, a story with images. When uh, we chose the letters uh, at the beginning, I was uh, focused on their contents. For example, I found the letters of a veteran of, a, um, of a Second World War, which uh, in my eyes was perfect because uh, in two pages uh, it uh, condensed uh, everything that historians have written about veterans. But the director, Marco Santarelli, did, uh, did not want uh, to use it because according to him, the letter was not visual. It was not possible to transform it uh, into images. So little by little, step by step, I entered the process uh, that is uh, trying to imagine a story in images. And working with Marco made me aware of how the letters were impregnated with images, those of magazine, those of cinema, and from uh, mid-50s, uh, um, those of television. You cannot imagine how many letters refer to television. And uh, these uh, um, images aroused new wants and desires in Italian population, and at the same time, uh, they helped uh, also, <coughs> sorry, they help uh, to shape the public uh, profile of the president. So I think it would be mm, good uh, to watch the film now and uh, have a further discussion afterward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I enjoy this, uh, this film and uh, I enjoyed your book very much. And there are a few issues, that some of them David already mentioned them in the presentation. And my, my first question is a, um, can be a bit polemical, maybe. And uh, these enormous amount of documents on which you work, collected, uh, transcribed, studied, they are, on one hand, that's in, in my vision, the sign of a connection with the institutions. Italian people, at the birth of the Republic, but beginning in 1946, write hundreds of thousands of letters to the President of the Republic. So they show that they have a connection, that they can talk to him about their house, or the house that they don't have, or the problems of people that were still prisoners of war, way after the war was ended. Uh, daily life things, that, as we saw, very touching. Um, but at the same time, it seems to me it, that it's the sign of a very immature people, politically. Um, because it's the substitute for the supplica to the king or to, or to the pope, as it was very common. So the idea that there is this superior authority to whom you can basically say, ask anything and that is a sort of magic wand that can uh, help problems disappear. 
And as you notice in, your, in the introduction to your, your book, the idea of the letter to the president is not even contemplated juridically. They have to find a way, saying it's a way of um, an expression of your thought. That's protected by the Constitution. So you express your thought to the president of the republic. That's legally, that's the only uh, thing. But there, there is this legacy of centuries in which Italians, and I remember there is the beautiful line in The Leopard, in which uh, they have this discussion, the leopard, the prince of Salina, that has voted for the referendum to uh, join the kingdom of Italy, and Don Ciccio Tumeo, who is the organist yeah. of the church, who voted against the uh, annexation of, of Sicily to Italy. And he, he talks about this supplica. He said, my mother was poor, and we were many kids, but when she sent a supplica, a, a petition to the court, she would receive this number of ducats that would allow me to study and become the organist. The idea that the king is your last instance. And in this case, the president took the, the place of, of the king. So this idea, on one hand, that from the very beginning have, they have this connection with the new institution, but at the same time, in, a, a political immaturity is a sign of great political immaturity when you ask the president of the republic for uh, many of the things that these people ask. Did you have the same impression? How did you handle these contrasting? Yes, I had the same impression, because if you look at the um, structure of the letter, you have the feeling that you are reading a letter to the king, to the pope, but not, to, not a letter from a citizen to the president of the republic. At the same time, let me say that there are also uh, petitions quite different. For example, yeah. the first letter um, written mm -hmm. by a teacher uh, stressing the necessity that uh, the new republic uh, um, focuses on um, schools and uh, education and so on is, uh, I mean, a, a real petition. And also the woman who um, writes uh, for having the light. Uh, I mean, Absolutely. in some cases, uh, the um, immigrant, uh, it's a bit bizarre, the idea to bury the, the um, body of an unknown worker, but it's very strong from... And it's based on, on what they did for soldiers, the yeah. burial. Yeah. Uh, and they, yeah. they had a mother choosing uh, mm. one body of the unidentified soldiers. Yes. And they wanted to do the same thing for workers. For, yes, yeah. yes. So, so it's quite... Uh, a, but uh, of course, uh, when I was reading the letters, uh, I had the feeling that uh, it's uh, la pancia del paese. Yes. <laughs> that writes. I mean, it's... Uh, for, um, for example, we are in the 60s, and people were uh, demonstrating in the streets, the students, uh, 68, and all this stuff. Of course, these people don't write to the president. Yes. Uh. And, and the, con the connection that is um, the president of the Republic in Italy, as we mentioned, does not really have powers. Uh, I mean, he has a two fundamental powers. One, to appoint the prime minister based on the recommendations that he receives from the parties that are present in parliament. And in some cases, it's an automatic choice because if you have a clear majority, the president can only appoint the person that the party that has the absolute majority tells him. I think in Italy it happened only once when uh, in, in 1948. After that, all the governments have been coalition government. And therefore, this power that seemed at the beginning notarile, like of a notary that yes. simply write down what um, uh, the, the people, the parliament tell him, has, is very delicate. Uh, the other one is the, to call for uh, early elections. That's another fundamental power. And that's the only thing he can do. Many of the other things are not really like he presides, he's the chairman of the Camp Superior Council of, of the Judiciary. He doesn't really decide anything for that. He's the head of the Supreme Council of Defense. He doesn't take any uh, decision that is relevant for the defense of the country. So much so that every act of the President of the Republic has to be countersigned either by the Prime Minister or by a minister or it's void. And, but in this case, reading this letter and the issues that they raise, I thought that it, on some level, the prerogatives of the President of the Republic 
anticipated the, the building of a welfare state that Italy didn't have. Yes. These people ask for subsidies when they're unemployed. They ask for an extra help when they are uh, unable to perform certain jobs. Um, they ask for uh, health assistance. Yes. Um, so the other idea is that the presidency of the republic, that is, you know, it's in the palace of the Quirinale, in this fantastic uh, papal uh, palace, uh, but at the same time, as a matter of fact, it had hundreds of people that were replying to these letters and somehow creating uh, the premise of what could be a welfare state. Still, welfare state, we call it when what you obtain is your entitlement and you feel it's your right. And in this case, they ask it almost as a privilege. But from a practical point of view, they really did yes. intervene in these, in these cases. Especially and in the, the case... The numbers uh, are staggering, right? Yeah. Especially in the case of uh, President uh, Julian Audi. He was president from uh, 1948 to 1955, so in a period in which uh, Italy was a poor country. And um, he and his wife, uh, Ida Donna, Audi, Ida. Donna Ida, yes, really helped people. Really, they spent a lot of money to buy medicine, uh, and um, especially medicine and uh, also for um, subsidies. Uh, Warm clothes, uh, uh, yeah, books yeah, for, the, for yeah, the children to go yeah, to school. Yeah, um, and uh, Ida uh, did a lot uh, for poor people. Uh, let me say that um, if the president doesn't have a lot of power, where uh, in Italy the first lady doesn't exist. Now to exactly. At least we think that... Uh, and uh, that was my next question. Please please talk about <laughs> our first ladies of this first part of the republic. Yeah. Now, I finish with uh, the yes. so-called yes. welfare state. In the case of uh, um, Gronchi, yeah. It's very clear that the way in which he spent money is also to create consensus. Uh, it's, uh, it's through his party, is uh, quite uh, related to local powers. Uh, so do you see how the party system uh, take uh, Take control. Take control, yeah. 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 And we have to say, though, that all in all, aside from the exception, Gronchi was a party man. Yeah. But uh, in the history of the Republic, normally the president of the Republic was somehow sort of a uh, non-official leader of the party. It was never the most important leader of any party. Yeah. It was not the most important leader of the Christian Democrats. It was never the most important of the, of the socialists when they finally arrived. Um, and maybe also because of that, people fel felt this connection. Um, that they saw him as somebody disembodied from the system of parties. Yeah, At an appearance, on, yeah. uh, as you said, some presidents, like Gronchi, mm -hmm. uh, used the power that they had to help people in order to channel the help yeah. in a certain direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk about the first ladies. Yeah. Yes, the, the, the role doesn't exist. Yeah. It's so much so that we use the English expression. Yeah, I was quite surprised because um, Donna Ida uh, did a lot uh, in um, assistance for people and so on. Then um, Donna Gronchi, she answered the petition the petitions, mm -hmm. the letters, uh, uh, so she was uh, quite helpful uh, um, from this point of view. And uh, she traveled a lot with um, his husband. They came internationally, right? Internationally. They were the first presidents that really... And the first president who came to the States. Yeah. yeah. And Donna Gronchi had a lot of connections uh, with uh, women association and organizations uh, in the States, but also in Brazil. Uh, so you have the feeling that uh, they have a role. It's a relative role as uh, um, the power of the president is uh, relative. I mean, it's not so so important. Uh, but also the first ladies, uh, I mean, uh, do their job. <laughs> and in Italy, we have also the case in which 
two presidents instead of having their wife serving in these, of course, an official capacity as first lady, that their daughter. And one was uh, the daughter of Saragat, yes. and the other one is of uh, yeah. President Scalfaro, that of course is yes. not within your book. But there was this official recognition that the daughter represented the feminine side of the presidents of the Republic, and therefore people also wrote to them. Yes, there are a lot of letters to Ernestina Saragat, uh, Saragat daughter, yeah. And the other, and of course, uh, being Italy, the concept of family is very extended. Yeah. And so all the women that somehow gravitate around the president are possible interlocutors, and you yeah. can write a letter to the niece of the president, yeah. hoping that she will deliver your message and your request to the president. And that's a case that you, you find documented uh, in a rather consistent way. Yes, all the uh, Gronkis family participates in uh, receiving <laughs> and receiving letters, and um, they transmitted uh, the letters to the presidency of the republic. So it was um, a way in which it was easier to reach uh, the president. And I mm. remember in one of the uh, of one of these occurrences of the Kova, was it? Was Kova, the yes. Of the, yeah. of the niece, the niece uh, of there Trump. is the, a note of the head of the secretary of the president of the republic that says, we have received this letter from the nepote. He uses the old expression, yeah. not nipote, as we say in, Itali in modern Italian, yeah. but nepote is the Renaissance expression. Yeah. And he said, it's all in there. You know that the word nepotism, or nepotism in English, comes from where? The Italian, obviously, but in which specific occurrence? Yeah. For it was a, a, an official title in the College of Cardinals. When a pope was elected, one of the first acts that he did was to appoint a nephew, since in theory they could not have sons and daughters, some of them did, as we know, uh, appointed a nephew within his family as cardinal. And within the College of Cardinals, he in practice had the same role that now as the Secretary of State, therefore dealing with the international policy of the Vatican on behalf of the, of the Pope. And I found that this nepote instead of nipote in that uh, note from the Presidenza del Consiglio, it says it all about Italy and nepotism transferring from the Vatican. So it's not only that the President of the Republic mm. inherited the palace, yeah. inherited a system of power. I'm very sorry that I didn't ask you to read the book before to publish it because it's I didn't perfect. notice yeah. nepote. No, but it's, yeah. it's perfect. Yeah. It's, it's yes. It brings back all these connections of... Uh, yeah. um, and the other thing that I, I was noticing that more during the screening of the film, that the first presidents in particular were very careful not to appear too much and not to appear different from anybody else. When you see that there is a, a group of dignitaries, it's impossible to, to distinguish who the president of the republic is that Italy was so saturated with the exaltation of Mussolini, yeah. the face of Mussolini, the body of Mussolini, the name of Mussolini everywhere, that one of their major concerns was to avoid to appear. They were one step back, especially the President of the Republic. Yes. And in the film, I think it's, it's very clear. Even if what they do is documented by the Instituto Luce, and then was it Settimana Income? That, yes. Um, but in a very, very different way, not as a um, populist leader. It's, it's, it's a high officer. It's a uh, high bureaucrat of so on, yes, on some sort. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to monopolize the discussion. I was supposed to coordinate the q and I'm going to shut up. And please, if you have any question um, for Professor Bertilotti about her book and about the film. Just a quick question. Does the president still live in such a luxurious palace today? Yes, he is. And, <laughs> and the other thing is, I, I am surprised that all of those letters were saved 
and responded to. I can't imagine that happening in this country. Yes, uh, they, they answered the letters and they tried to um, open a mailbox for emails, but uh, they had to close it in a few days because they received tons of uh, emails. You also have to say that the, uh, that the staff of the Quirinale, of the Quirinale Palace, I believe it's 20 times the staff of the White House. So we're talking, we're talking about, we're talking about thousands of people working in the, in the Quirinale Palace, not, uh, the White House, I think, it's a couple of hundred. It's not that big operation. And of course, that says a lot about the idea uh, that the President of the United States does not have to have a royal palace, and therefore the White House is a house, is not a palace. And also that the, it has to contain a very limited staff, uh, not the Quirinale. The Quirinale is like, really, it's, it's an enormous uh, bureaucratic machine. Probably, and trust. I was, would you say, Teresa, that of all the institutions of the Republic, of all the political institutions the Republic, the presidency of the Republic is the one that has more the trust and the confidence of the people, or can you think of any other? Maybe the Pope in Italy. No, no but no, in, no, no, the state, no. Not, but, not mm, the judiciary, because it's always a judiciary. Yeah, country. yes. Uh, and let no. Uh, let's say that you are supposed to send petitions uh, to the parliament. Yeah. But it's different, no? Because it's an institution, it's not a single person. So it's... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. I just wanted to echo your point about... Uh, the uh, uh, the president, and as a child, I, I I spent a little bit of time in school in Italy, and then I went and spent a lot of summers. But I always saw uh, a presidente della Repubblica come il nonno, and that's what my cousins always removed there to help, but uh, not the father, uh, the, uh, the grandfather of the country. Pretty accurate. I, I don't agree. Yes. Okay. Yes, but uh, um, when people uh, write letters, they refer to him as the father of the nation. You are like, a f mm, both from the symbolic point of view, the father of the nation, but also uh, a father. So I write to you as I mm, can write to my father. It's one of the most used rhetorical devices. Yeah. Also with the first ladies, they mm. appeal to their sense of maternity, and that's why uh, they, um, they talk to them, they, they write to them. Um, and talking about the, the language of this letter, Teresa, you were underlining, um, it's, it's difficult to put a date on them, because as you said, they could have been written to the Pope or to, or to the King, and there is this thing of the eccellenza, eccellenza, and that was one of the um, typical uh, markers of fascist language. Uh, that was the title that Mussolini had for himself. That's the title that every prefect that is the representative of the government in a province was in Eccellenza. The ambassador uh, was Eccellenza. Um, and this thing carries over in the Republic. Yeah. And the language is very, very, uh, like many other aspects of Italian life, didn't go through a process of purification. Yeah. or uh, epuration, yeah. as, as it was called. Yeah. And, and it, it, it moves untouched from, from the dictatorship to the republic. Uh, and I believe that the, the old name of the Eccellenza was abolished only by Napolitano when he was uh, Minister of the Interior. President Napolitano visited Casa Italiana, actually, in one of his previous incarnations as, as Minister of the Interior. He said, enough with his Eccellenza, <laughs> their name and the title, the, the president, see, no president, mm -hmm. like you, uh, the chairman, you, the 
title and seniority. It's enough. Uh, but of course, nobody listens to me. <laughs> And everybody is doing it to me. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes, but in some cases, really mm, quite difficult to yes to put a date because there is the uh, to ask for a grace uh, and uh, supplica. And uh, they invoke God. Yeah, and yeah. And they promise prayers. For yes. For them. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, because it's a fantastic piece of Italian history. A uh, little question for uh, Teresa. Um, did you observe any uh, long-term tendency on letters? For example, did they increase in number, or did they change in style, or something that, uh, I mean, over all these decades, they may have changed or, n or not? Thank you. The major change is in the context. Uh, because um, in my from my point of view, uh, let's say from the mid '60s, uh, it's quite clear uh, the way in which uh, people ask for recommendation, and it's linked to the mm, political party system because uh, the right to the president uh, by stressing the, mm, the political um, affiliation and asking for, um, I want a job in that uh, society, um, that, mm, that factory, for example, uh, uh, that is run from uh, by a um, guy from my party, from your party. Th there is this... Uh, uh, Yes, uh, there is also continuity in the letters, b as uh, we said about uh, the language uh, and, um, and the themes, right? You, mean you were able to identify um, several themes, six or seven big themes. Housing, housing, uh, work, work uh, um, justice, like when people feel yeah. victims of an injustice within the judicial system. Um, yeah. and Pensions yeah. <laughs> and the welfare yeah, more yes, general. yes, yeah. And, but with regard to the question, one, another thing that you noticed, for example, was that from the first year of the presidency of Sandro Pertini to the last year of his presidency, the letters doubled. They went yeah. from 150,000 per year to 300,000 per year. Yes. So normally <laughs> that's a sign of the popularity of a president. Yes, also the fact uh, that uh, you have to take into consideration the fact uh, that in the 50 Italians were not uh, so literate, so... <laughs> and one of them even says it. Yeah. Finally found mm. a good soul yeah. that put into writing what I want to tell you because yes. I can yes. read and write. Mm. Yes. Now you can, um, if you <laughs> want, you can go to archive to see the letter sent uh, to Leone. And it must be <laughs> interesting because... Uh, yeah. He was the only president to be impeached and yeah. forced to resign before the end of, of his term. Yes. <laughs> he probably deserved the vote. Yes. On his own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had ju uh, just one other comment. It, what struck me from the tone of the letters is that Italy is has a diverse population, north, south, east, and west. But the feeling was is as though it, it's almost like a family that they were writing to their father, and it could almost be the role of the Catholic Church and the Pope as a father figure. Right, you know, just in general, wherever they were in the country or even in Brazil, writing like a family to their father to, to help, you know, asking for help or adjudication or whatever. Yes, I think it's a good, it's good, a, point. It's a good point, yes. Because there is uh, not another way. 
as I told before, they tried to open a mailbox, but they received uh, so many emails that uh, they had to um, to close it, uh, to stop it. So, so letter, yeah. So you, um, if you want to, Be yeah, uh, the only the way it's uh, to write a letter. <laughs> Yeah. is something that is one innovation that has been accepted because you can do that. But more for parliament, for, uh, maybe, than for the president. Yeah, uh, for the president it's not yeah. possible, no. Mm. So you have to write a letter. You can use your computer, or your pen, or what you want, but uh, it's a letter. Yes, that yes. is Marco Santarelli. <laughs> yes, uh, there is a difference in the way in which uh, you approach uh, a, a president. Um, but for, for example, when uh, Saragat uh, uh, was elected, um, he received a number of letters from uh, um, people uh, uh, welcome a social a socialist to the presidency, and so he received also a lot of letters of workers asking for um, um, better work conditions uh, um, and so on. And also the fact, uh, for example, that Gronchi represented himself uh, as a father, a father of a family. We use some. Um, a movie of uh, Gronki and the family. Uh, it helps. It helped uh, um, citizen to write to him uh, as a father, and I mean it was a, it was a, um, a construction. I mean uh, he was aware of the power of television, so um, to represent himself in that way was uh, to represent uh, uh, as Italian wants the president to be represented. So yes, there is a there is a difference uh, in, in. For example, it would be very interesting to see the letters sent to Pertini, because Pertini was so popular. And but we have to wait and some more years. We received hundreds of thousands of high school students. In yeah. Particular. Every day there were classes and classes. From yeah. yeah. And it was basically an open mic, uh, open microphone. But yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and people at the Quirinale w yeah. went crazy because of, for I mean, um, security and. Could, could I ask a question about the metaphor of the clock? I mean, maybe I'm a little. <laughs> is it simply like the passage of time, or is it also the difference between the opulence of the palazzo and the simplicity of the people who are? Uh, like yes, both. Uh, um, as you know, in the Quirinale there is a huge collection of. Uh, watches so it mm, it was to show how uh, rich is uh, the palace uh, uh. Half a dozen people that just the yeah yes 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 mm. Mm. but let's say that president champi opened the gardens and now you can visit also the palazzo uh, so it's 
I, I did it. Brought my NYU student uh, to summer school. It's a great experience. So if yeah. you go to Bronx, I mean, it's uh, free, but you have just to make sure. a reservation online, yeah. and you can do um, the inside of the palace. Yes. Mm. And on the 2 of June, uh, on the 2nd of June, uh, the gardens <laughs> to celebrate the Republic. And I did yeah, we, we couldn't, uh, couldn't hear you. You had a chance, you or the filmmaker had a chance to speak to the family uh, of the people who actually wrote the letters. No, um, we looked for um, the three guys who sent the letter in 1969, and it was quite difficult to find them, but uh, at the end we find uh, one of them, the um, professor of uh, Spanish at the university, and through him uh, we found uh, the other two. And it was amazing because uh, going to Tortoreto, Tortoreto is a small village in Abruzzo, and uh, I went there with the director, with Marco, and Marco um, uh, along the way asked me, but uh, if they are, if they are not good on on, on television, on do you see when you? Uh, Maybe they are nice people, but are not uh, good uh, in um, being. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, no, it, I mean, from my point of view, they are perfect. <laughs> there are three different uh, um, personalities, but quite uh, nice. And yeah. in, the, in the book, you basically uh, delete almost all the names. Yeah. In some cases, also, mm -hmm. the location is different. Yeah, because. Uh, uh, Yeah. So you also protect the privacy. Yes, you are n you are not allowed to um, to write uh, the name. Uh, so in the case of small villages, uh, I wrote uh, the um, provincia and not uh, the um, and not the name. And I am sorry because in one case, uh, no, I of course I, I put some names: uh, Fernand Brodel, uh, yeah, and uh, Volpe, mm -hmm. Volpe Son wrote a moving letter and quite um, strong, quite interesting. Uh, but in I didn't put the name of a famous uh, sculptor who was invited uh, in 1978 uh, to celebrate uh, the um, Republic on 2nd of June. And uh, he wrote a letter that uh, it's a, it condensed uh, the 68 uh, uh, feeling, let's say. But um, the most interesting is the, mm, the information sent by the police. Uh, they sent a, mm, a report to the presidency, say that he, was, um, he belongs to extremely left, he was a Maoista, and uh, he was uh, denounced, how do you say, it was um, denunciato because he left you his wife, uh, and in the okay. 68, you are not allowed to, to live. His wife sued him for having uh, yeah. abandoned the family. Yeah, yeah. And before yeah. the introduction of divorce, yeah. if you left your household, that's yeah. a crime. Yeah. Abandonment is based upon the Yes, yeah. <laughs> Why don't we close with the letter of Fernando Rodel? Because it's uh, you know, one of the most uh, uh, important historians of the, of the 20th yeah. century, and he writes a petition to the <laughs> As uh, Monsieur le Président, and we, as and thank a colleague, yes, a as a colleague, and as a, yeah. Professor. What does Fernando Del tell uh, um, He complained, <laughs> yeah, because he complained about um, the National Archive in Venice and the way in which it was so difficult to work there. Yeah. <laughs> archive, archive in Venice, yeah. Famous French historian yeah. complained with the president of the Republic about the lack of accessibility yeah. of the documents and uh, emphasizing the importance of opening the archives. And well, it's maybe thanks to that.
that, that you were able to access the archive <laughs> of the President of the Republic and to uh, produce a book that is really, as uh, Sasha Pugliese said, it's, it's a beautiful, and the film too, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful way of looking at the founding years in the, in the history yeah. of the and I hope historians are going to use these documents because, uh, um, I mean, it's are very, very useful. Uh, I was quite uh, um, impressed and moved by the letter sent uh, immediately um, after the war. And because uh, through this letter, you see from a subjective point of view, some um, historical event, uh, for example, the purges, yeah, yeah? and uh, the amnistia. And the way which people perceive that the amnesty was not yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I hope uh, historians are going to work on this document. I'm sure. And we thank you again for thank you. Talk and for mm. having taken mm. the time to discuss it with us. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. you. Thank you.